that. Okay. Um, okay, so I'll start off um, finishing up um, chapter 11. I'll start with um, 11.5, which is a completely new section. But <laughs> so date time color scales. Um, so when a color aesthetic is mapped to a date time type, ggplot2 uses scale color date or scale color date time to specify the scale. These are designed to help um, data analogous to the data scales discussed in section 10.2. And these scales have data breaks and data label arguments that make it easier to work with these data as they are slightly contrived examples <laughs> below illustrate. Yeah. Um, yeah, so this one. Yeah, so this one, okay. So the difference between these next two is how they did the breaks. So this one you see for like the scale, it goes from like 1970 to 210. 2010. Um, and then with this one, where they made the breaks um, 142 months, it goes like from July 19, 1967 to November 2014. And yeah, it's just the same graph. It's the same graph, but like with the different breaks in it based on the dates. And then you have 11.6 alpha scales. Um, alpha scales map the transparency of a shade to a value in the data and can be a convenient way to visually downweight less important ob observations. Scale alpha is an alias for scale alpha continuous um, and since that is the most common use of alpha, um, instead of having the right scale alpha continuous, scale alpha saves you a bit of typing. And yeah, so again, they use the um, faithful um, like the old faithful data set with the eruptions, um, with the density, and yeah. So the scale alpha continue, the scale continuous, where you see on the legend, like the density changes from like the darker to like the lighter, or, or rather the more transparent, like the more um, deeper color to like the more transparent versus like um, the gradient. All right, so then we have legend position. Um, the number of settings that affect the overall display of the legends are controlled through the theme system. Um, you'll learn more about them in section 18.2, but for now all you need to know is that you can modify theme settings with the theme function. Um, and the position of just and justifications of legends are controlled by the theme setting um, legend.position, which takes value right, left, top, bottom, or none. So this one is with the legend position left. This one um, with the legend position equal to right, which is the default. Um, this one, the le legend position at the bottom. And this one where there's no legend with legend position none. Um, switching between left, right, and top, bottom modifies how the keys in each legend are laid out, horizontal or vertically and how multiple legends are stacked horizontal or vertically. If needed, you can adjust these options independently with like legend.direction, which is um, changes the layout of items in legends from horizontal or vertical, horizontal or vertical legend box, um, the arrangement of multiple legends, um, legend.box.just, which is the justification of each legend within the overall bounding box when there are multiple legends. And alternative, Alternatively, if there's a lot of blank space in your plot, you might want to place the legend inside the plot by setting legend.position to the numeric vector of length two. And the numbers represent a relative location in the area. C01 is the top left corner and C110 is the bottom right corner. And you can control which corner of the legend, um, the legend legend.position refers to with legend.justification which is specified in a similar way. Unfortunately, positioning the legend exactly where you want requires a lot of trial and error. <laughs> so yeah, this is where they're positioning the legend in within the plot rather than outside of it. And then this one, yeah. And I think what they meant by the trial and error, like as far as like with, like what you put in this changes exactly where the legend is. Same thing with this one. Okay, so now we're going to chapter 12. 
um, other aesthetics and the learning objectives are to learn about several other aesthetics that ggplot can use to represent data, including size scales, shape scales, line type scales, manual scales, and identity scales. Okay, um, okay so 12.1, size. The size aesthetic is typically used to scale points and text. The default scale for size um, size of aesthetics is size underscore scale, size under, uh, scale underscore size, uh, in which a linear increase in the variable is mapped onto a linear increase in the area, not the radius of the geom. And um, so that's, yeah. And yeah, and since I'm very new to art, it's kind of hard for me to like completely understand the, um, everything in the code. So if anyone wants to chime in, feel free. <laughs> yeah. With this one. Yeah, so this these two are where they're just changing the size of it. And then so there are several size scales. Size um scale underscore size underscore area and scale underscore size underscore bin underscore area are versions of scale underscore size and scale underscore size underscore bend that ensure that a value of zero maps to an area of zero. Scale under, under, uh, underscore radius maps the data value to the radius rather than the, to the area. Um, we'll learn more about that in section 12.1.1. Um, scale, scale undersize, underscore size underscore bend is a size scale that behaves like scale underscore size, but maps continuous values onto discrete size categories, analogous to the bin position and color scales discussed in sections 10.4 and 11.4 respectively. Um, and the legends associated with the scale are discussed in section 12.1.2. And then you have scale undersize, underscore size underscore date and scale underscore size underscore date time are designed to handle date data analogous to the date scales discussed in section 10.2. Okay, so 12.1.1 radius size scales. Um, there are situations where area scaling is undesirable. And for such situations, um, scale underscore radius may be more appropriate. For example, consider a data set containing astronomical data that includes the radius of different planets. Um, so yeah, we have the planets within our solar, solar system, um, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So the first plot, um, it doesn't, like this one is, Desi Hugh with the title, this one is not to scale. Um, I, didn't, <clears throat> I didn't include the little blurb from the text, but what it was saying is the fact that um, you can't really tell from this that Jupiter is not like it, it would appear that Jupiter and Saturn are the same size, but in reality, Jupiter is bigger than Saturn um, by a magnitude of twice the Earth's Earth's mass, I guess it was. So and then in this plot, which is which is to scale, you can you can kind of see that Jupiter and Saturn aren't quite the exact same size. And in general, even with like the other with the other plots, there's there's like slight differences in the size, and it's based on like scaling it to the actual radius of the planets. So then we have twelve point one point two bin size scales. Um, the bin size scales work similarly to bin scales for color and position aesthetics. Um, sections eleven point four and ten point four, with the acceptance with the exception of how legends are displayed. The default legend for a bin size scale and all bin scales except position and color aesthetics is governed by guide underscore bins. For instance, in the MPG data, we could use size underscore sale under, underscore bin to create a bin version of the continuous variable highway. Okay, so, then, so yeah, so this is like the base plot. Um, and then unlike guide underscore legend, the guide created for a bin scale by um, guide bins does not organize the individual key into a table. Instead, they are arranged in a column or row um, along a single vertical or horizontal axis 
um, which by default is displayed, displayed on its own axis. Um, and the important, the important arguments to guide bins, guide underscore bins is, are listed below and their axis, which indicates whether the axis should be drawn. So this one where they have axis equals to false, there isn't, um, there's no axis on the legend, like how you see here. Um, yeah. And then for the next one, direction is a character string specifying the direction of the guide either vertical, which is the default, or horizontal. So yeah, so within this code, we're in guide underscore bins, they put direction is equal to horizontal. So you see it's um, horizontal versus the vertical, which was the default. And then you have show limits, which specifies um, whether tick marks are shown at the ends of the guide access, um, where the default is false. So here, um, where we put show limits within the code equal to true, you see where that's kind of like the tick marks at each. Yeah, and then by default, I think this one is the default. Well, by the default, they don't have like the tick marks at the very top. And like this one doesn't have the, where it doesn't have the axis, it doesn't have any tick marks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> True, it is very useful. Um, let's see. And then we also have axis.color, axis.line width, and axis.rl are used to control the guide axis that is displayed alongside the legend keys. And then, so yeah, so then in this one, in the legend, you see where they put um, an arrow. Um, so they have axis.arrow and it gives it the length and the end and the, the close. Yeah, I should read a bit more into it, but yeah, basically all of this gives you the ability to like edit the axis itself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. and then, oh. then you have um, key, key width, key height, reverse, and override aesthetic. Um, they have the same behavior for guide bins as they do for guide legend, um, which you can see in section 11.3.6. Okay, so 12.2 is shape. Um, values can be mapped to the shape aesthetic, most typically when you have a small number of discrete categories. Note that if the data variable contains more than six values, it becomes difficult to distinguish between the shapes and will produce an error. And although any one plot is unlikely to, is unlikely to be readable with um, six distinct markers, there are 15 possible shapes to choose from. Um, the default scale underscore shape function contains a single argument set solid is equal to true, which is the default to, um, to use a palette consisting of three solid shapes and three hollow shapes or set solid equal to false to use a six hollow shapes. So this one where like the base plot where it um, defaults to the solid shapes and this one where the solid is equal to false where you get the hollow shapes. And then you can specify the marker types for each data value manually using scale underscore shape underscore manual. Um, for more information about manual scale, see section 12.4. Okay. And yeah, so again, with regards to how they had um, the 25 shapes that you can choose from, there were their um, choosing exactly which shapes to use, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so basically how they, some of them are solid and some of them are hollow. Yeah. And then 12.3 line type. Um, it is possible to map a variable onto the line type aesthetic, which works best for discrete variables with a small number of categories, where scale underscore line type is an alias for scale underscore line type under scale discrete. Um, continuous variables cannot be mapped to line type unless scale underscore line type underscore bin is used. And although there is a scale underscore line, underscore line type underscore continuous function, all it does is produce an error. So here we have like um, 
the plot where you see the different um the various line types which you can see in like the legend um and with five categories above plot can be quite difficult to read um i guess kind of like distinguishing like the different line types i'd say like especially right here it's yeah and then the default palette for line types is supplied by the scales line type underscore pal function and includes the 13 line types shown below so yeah these are the 13 line types it's like solid lines dashed lines dotted lines and you can control the line type by specifying a string up to eight hexadecimal values um and in the specification um the first well in the one below the first value is the length of the first line segment the second value is the length of the first space between segments and so on and this allows you to specify your own line types using scale underscore line type underscore manual or alternatively by passing a custom function to the palette argument and note that the last four lines um you see there are blank because the line types function defined above returns na when the number of categories exceeds nine and again where it said there are like 13 different ones so yeah so that's why the four of them are empty so i guess these are like kind of manually defined line types and then okay so the scale underscore line type function contains the n, n dot na dot value argument used to specify what kind of line is plotted for these values and by default they produce a blank a blank line um but you can override this by setting na dot value equal to dotted um so you see here instead of having the blank the blank line as they called it it just um has the dotted because of the na dot value equal dotted um valid line types can be set using a human readable character string such as blank, solid, dashed, um, dotted, dot dash, long dash, and two dash. Um, those are all understood um, readable characters that you can put in. So we have 12.4 um, manual scales. Um, manual scales are just a list of valid values that are mapped to the unique, um, unique discrete values. And if you want to customize these scales, you need to create your own new scale with the manual version of each um, using scale underscore line type underscore manual or scale underscore shape underscore manual or scale underscore color underscore manual, etc. Um, the manual scale has one important argument values, which you specify um, where you specify the values that the scale should produce if the specter is named. It will match the values of the output to the values of the input. Otherwise, it will match in order of the levels of the discrete variables. Um, you will need some knowledge of the val valid aesthetic values, which are described in the vignette of ggplot2 spec. Um, manual skills have appear appeared earlier in sections 11.3.4 and 12.2. And in the following example, you'll see a creative use of scale underscore color underscore manual to display multiple variables, variables on the same plot and show a useful legend. Um, and in plotting, most plotting systems, you'd color the lines and then add a legend. Um, this doesn't work in ggplot because there's no way to add a, a legend manually. Oh, this is the wrong data. Uh, oh, I apologize some of it messed up at some point i have the wrong uh i apologize some of my yeah these are the wrong charts yeah they're actually supposed to be um line it's actually supposed to be line charts where basically it's like um from the data when you plot it it doesn't actually give you the legend because there's no um yeah, it doesn't actually give you the legend itself. So instead you have to, um, you have to, let me see, to add it manually. And instead of giving it um, in form of 
transformative labels. Um, you then tell the scale how to map the labels to the colors. So yeah, so where red is the above line and blue is the below line. Ah, I did not catch that. I apologize. <laughs> and then 12.5 identity, identity scales. Um, identity scales such as scale underscore color under I, underscore identity and scale underscore shape underscore identity are used when your data is already scaled such that the data and aesthetic spaces are the same. And the code below shows an example where the identity scale is useful. LUV underscore colors um, contains the location of all R's built in colors in the LUV color space, um, the spaces that the space that HCL is based on. So yeah, I will not understand the code, but it's so pretty. <laughs> and yeah, so that is the end of chapter 11, 11 and 12. Yeah. Oh, let's see. Mine has. And let me see. I don't think you guys can. Oh, it's switching back to the thing. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Let me. Do the screen share for that. But yeah, so this was, thank you for sharing this. Yeah, so with the um, the manual scales, this was the part where the, yeah, my two graphs that were missing, where it's, um, yeah, so where you were displaying the multiple variables on the same plot and show, yeah, yeah so there it doesn't have a legend. And then that doesn't work with ggplot because there's no way to add a legend manually. Um, instead, you give the lines informative labels. So, yeah. Yeah, so instead of color is equal to red, color is equal to blue. Um, yeah. They gave the colors, I guess the colors. Mm -hmm. And then with this one where they added the scale underscore color underscore manual, I guess. Yeah, where they set above is equal to red and below is equal to blue. They're able to change the colors from, I guess, those default colors to now they're red and blue. But yeah, yeah. I don't know how you, I thought I saw the charts <laughs> in the one I made. But yeah, so, and yeah. And then again, with identity skills, that's so pretty. If anyone knows how to like um, explain that a bit more, yeah. So funny. <laughs> But that's pretty much all I have. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, sorry, can you go back to <clears throat> can you go back to um, the to which one? Just the ones that you're just showing a second ago. I was okay. trying to understand why okay. you had to have uh, just a little bit higher. Uh, um, I'm trying to understand why you have to have two geom line, like oh, why you have to plot the above and then also the below separately. Are those not, um, they're not part of the data? So I, no, I don't think they're part of the original data because I guess this is like time series. Yeah, I'm still very new to this. So if I'm wrong, someone please correct me. Uh, but I guess, okay. yeah. But yeah, it doesn't originally, it doesn't originally come up with, um, an actual legend all they were able to do here was like add the colors to the lines themselves and then this one where they give um the color equal to above and below that way it added the legend and yeah then again where they put above is equal to red and below is equal to blue where they were able to change the color there yeah I'm trying to see the original data set for lake huron mm. It's as numeric Lake Huron. Hmm? <laughs> I was just trying to see the data set. So you, um, if you want a screen share, yeah, I've been asking to pull it up to look at. Yeah. Let me try this. Um, I don't. I don't have anything. I don't have something to share. I'm just um, oh, okay. kind yeah. of playing around on my side. I wonder if I can go back to my R. Um, 
So I'm just doing, I guess, looking at the help um, the data set, the Lake Huron, um, annual measurements of the level and feet of Lake Huron from 1875 to 1972. And yeah, so a time series of length 98. Yeah, yeah. I get it. So it was a, it was a very, it looks like it's a very contrived um, data set because the Lake Huron data is just a vector of numbers. It's the, yeah, annual measurements of the level in feet. So it's like every year just has one measurement. So yeah. then they created this data set by adding, uh, by doing one line at the level plus five and then a separate line at the level minus five. So, um, so I get it. So then, yeah naturally you couldn't add a legend in there because you are you're creating the data like on the at the plot like on the plot level there's not a column in the data set that says is it above or is it below yeah so you could make a you could make a data set right so each year would have two records one for the above which is level plus five and one for the below level minus five and then then you would have a legend Okay. Anyway, just thinking out loud, exploring the thoughts. I don't know if I, if that's actually true, what I just said, but I'll try it. I appreciate it. Cause yeah, I'm definitely still learning all of this. <laughs> yeah. So thank you. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Did anyone else have any other questions or want to see any, a different part of the um, presentation, the book down? I can go back to it. Oh, I have to run it again. Sorry, I'm just knitting the file again. <laughs> but yeah, and anyone had any questions? <laughs> or even any comments? Because yeah, I'd love to learn more about it. I'm typing into the uh, chat for Zoom. Uh, I always forget how to list the installed data sets from the packages. Um, it's data uh, open and close parentheses, and that will list all of your pre-installed data sets. Um, and then to answer Ryan's question, um, I always put a question mark on the front of something if it's of anything, if there's a help menu or anything. So when I did question mark like uh, Huron, it pulled up that same uh, page that you were looking at, or sorry, it was a help menu, but it, it mirrored what you were showing. Uh, Lydia on your uh, browser. Let me go back to, I think this is it. Okay, oh, no. I, uh, yeah. But yeah, that's all I have for now. I have to go back and add the um, the information for the different. Yeah, so they added limits, breaks, and yeah, they added a section for limits, breaks, and labels for each of them, and then also legends in it. So I did, I managed to put like the, I guess I put in the actual graphics themselves, but I didn't get time to like finish inputting the wording. So I guess if anyone wanted, had any comments about these, 
Wait, this one it looks like to have. Yeah, so this one, I guess, is the default of the legend. And then this one, this one where it's reverse is equal to two, where they reverse the, the way it's presented, where it goes from 20 to 40. And this one, it's like, yeah. And this one, I think this is the one where they made it smaller. Yeah. And this one where the direction is equal to horizontal. Also, this but yeah, so they added that to the continuous color scales for discrete. Yeah, so they added again the limit splits and labels to the section regarding discrete color scales. Okay, so I think these two plots where it was one of these plots, base 99 and base 08. And then I think this one where it was, so each of them, their legend, they're, they're plotting the same data, but because they don't have all of the same values, they don't have the same legend. So then they changed it to add the limits so that they all have the same legend, even if some of the data isn't present. So this one, I don't remember what it is for C and for C and I guess E, where they're not on this, this graph or base underscore 99, but you have them, you have like all of them for this graph. So that's how um just adding that to yeah, adding that to both of them. And this one, I can't remember exactly what that one was. And then this one where they add like the actual names to the labels versus it just versus it just being the D, C, and R. It's now diesel premium and regular using the labels. Yeah. Um, this one where they're adding the legends. I guess this is the default plot. Okay. And then this one where they added two columns for the legends. And then two columns. And I think the default is that the legends column, it's it goes by the column. So yeah, where it goes five, six, um, four, five, six, eight. And then this one where they do it, have the legend by the row, where it goes four to five um, horizontally, and then six to eight horizontally on the next row. Um, and then, yeah, I guess this one again is the base one. And then, yeah, so these two, again, where this is the base one, and then this one where they reverse the order of the legend guide, so where it goes horizontal, um, vertically from top to bottom, it goes from four to eight. And here we're vertically from top to bottom where the legend goes from eight to four. And then this one, and this one where they, oh, why did they do that here? I guess this is the, added like the alpha scale. So now some of them are more, um, transparent or translucent than others. I feel, like I feel like I'm missing something. I can't tell what I'm missing from that one to that one, but yeah. And then I guess send color scales. Again, oh, I don't have the, they might not have put um, actual glass for that one, but they did add like the legends. Again. And yeah, so this one where it's like thin versus a gradient. Show limits equal 
true. So yeah, where this one is show limits equal true, where instead of it just being 20, 30, 40, they have it from 10 to 50. Um, yeah, and I think that was, yeah. I think that's all that was included that wasn't covered from my last presentation. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone has any more comments or anything? Yeah. So that's the end of my presentation. Oh, oh. yeah. I don't know if I saw, um, well, I guess it was just posted in the thing I didn't get to do um, last week's Tidy Tuesday, maybe this week, <laughs> possibly. But yeah, I don't know, if Brian, if you wanted to talk about your experience with Tidy Tuesday. Um, uh, not necessarily that, I guess the biggest takeaway was don't just set aside two hours for it. Maybe set aside like two days. Um, cause you, you can easily, I think, get trapped into something. Um, yeah, that's true. Yeah. It was, I don't know, for me, it was good. It was a good experience. Um, <clears throat> and interestingly, you know, one of the things that you mentioned just now about, um, labeling the actual colors like not just going with the default colors but actually specifying how you want the um each of the things colored that came up but um anyway i i didn't really have anything to add i just you know i threw mine in the slack and on twitter and we'll see how it goes this week i was going to ask a separate question on a different topic though um <clears throat> we came across um d3 and JavaScript, just some discussions about that and making plots more interactive, but it, there wasn't a lot, there wasn't a lot to it. So um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with D3. I think I, I came across like a, an assessment of like the pros and cons for D3 versus ggplot versus, I don't know, Java, JavaScript. So. I don't know how it all works. If anybody really understands all all of that, um, that would be the the question that I would open. I was going to make a comment if it's all right, Ryan. Um, so D three JS, uh, if you ever go to the website D three JS, most of the developers within that community post their examples and you can scrape them, copy them, uh, fork them, whatever the case may be, and then develop your own. Um, I don't know, uh, visualization. The uh, the real trick with D3 versus ggplot or within our studio um, is complexity. Uh, you're entering the world of web development and JavaScript libraries uh, where you start to touch on uh, all the various just JavaScript languages. Um, there's so many out there. And, and so therefore it kind of, you, I don't know, you almost drop into this, this void of, of, crazy amounts of reading and, and understanding of exactly what libraries can be called and what frameworks and how to actually manipulate it, et cetera. Um, I wouldn't prevent anybody from going that direction. Um, I would only just give a life preserver to anybody that does make that leap. Um, one of the bridges that would possibly help in especially our learning communities is the R4D3 um, or R2D3. Is that the, I think it's R, R2D3. There's a uh, uh, jump that bridges between our studio uh, uh, scripting to generate your output in a D3 form. Um, that's another uh, way of, of, I guess, manipulating uh, that makes you feel confident and comfortable within your R studio uh, environment. So is this the correct understanding? So, um, well, I know when you generate visualizations just in R studio, they're static. Right, they're they're PNGs generally. Not necessarily. That's a good comment. No, not necessarily. There are so PNG would be a raster form. Same with bitmap, JPEG, mm -hmm. TIFF, GIF, etc. If you go into the vector side of things, that's where you're starting to talk about standard vectors, graphics, uh, encapsulated PostScript, EPS. Um, I haven't used any EMF or WMF forms. That's enhanced Metafile or Windows Metafile. Um, but those are vector forms 
that I believe are supported. I haven't actually looked into that. SVG is usually where I stay in though. So our studio can do both bitmap and vector graphic outputs. Then you just have to I, specify. The, the correct vocabulary you want to use in that statement is either raster or vector. Those are the two groupings that you're dealing with. And that's one's a polygon and the other one is more RGB values or, or yeah. your color hues to a, to a pixel. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but our studio can, or I, I mean, I get that it's R, but ggplot can output either of those. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, then D3 just extends that or it adds on and, and makes those, allows you to make interactive graphics? No, I, I, I think, well, I think the better way I would apply that question would be, so D3 is just data-driven documents. That's the, the term for it. But mm -hmm. the, uh, the interactivity piece that you're, you're talking about is where you start to add animation to your vector. Um, so you can start to access a lot of the HTML tags and, and vector JavaScript type tags, uh, scripting to um, I don't know, add animation. Um, I got off on a tangent. I'm sorry, I don't want want to take too much, but um, I was attempting to replicate a PowerPoint uh, animation in vector form for wiring diagrams. Um, all I ended up doing was uh, creating almost like a uh, epileptic, epileptic seizure, uh, flashing, strobing type of uh, effect on my wiring diagrams. Uh, I need to figure out a way to associate a mouse click to a uh, iteration of phasing uh, to make it look like a particular line is being drawn or a, a wire is being drawn, electrified. So um, I haven't actually successfully done that yet. So that's really where my novice levels and I don't have a direct answer to to uh, D3 as a, as a subject. Um, there is a learning community, or sorry, there is a community for um, D3. Um, I'll see if I can find the Slack channel, Ryan, if you're interested in it. Probably a silly question. What is D3? That wasn't a question. That was also kind of my question too. <laughs> it's, <laughs> a, it's a shortened version of, of data-driven documents. So if you talk about ggplot uh, as the grammar of graphics, that's where the gg comes from. So D3 is data-driven documents, and then they add the JavaScript side of it to make it web-friendly and interactive. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I thought it years ago, like if you're doing visualizations there, it was like, oh, you got to learn, got to learn D3. And now I was like, well, you can do a lot in R. Yeah. Looks like a quite different language, completely different. So, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't get too far into it, um, but it did look to me it would be like a different language that maybe somehow connects in. Like you can still, can you still write the code in in your R script, and or or do you have to do only part of it in R and then you um, like launch it or uh, like write it somewhere else to do the D three part, or is that even a question? That's where that. No, that's where that R2D3 package comes in. I'll see if I can find that link too. Uh, R2D3. I'm 99.9% I'm .9 sure I'm saying that correctly. It's a Star Wars uh, reference. That's why I'm finding it cool. Um, yes. and you've done, you've done some coding. You've done some coding. In, in uh, I've, uh, I've attempted. I won't say that I've successfully generated anything. So um, when we, so, so stepping away from the, the subject, when you are approaching this topic, you can do this in Python, you can do this in Ruby, you can do this in, in uh, RStudio. So these are just different scripting languages accessing JavaScript that would generate your vector output or manipulate your vector output. Um, so when you are, are uh, some websites are really kind of cool where you can grab an object. So that's listening to your mouse, uh, grab an object, you know, pull it to one side and it's like a rubber band. It'll kind of, you know, uh, uh, re replot your uh, graphic. 
that's where that interactive piece comes from. Well, to make it interactive, that's JavaScript. And so the, the language familiarity that you're looking at in some of those examples, Frederica, that you may be viewing at the moment, that's primarily either all in JavaScript or it is manipulating the standard vectors graphic as the document object model has uh, presented it. So it's like your, your client side runtime kind of scenario where uh, I'm watching my mouse pointer, I grab this node and I pull it over to this other side and then everything else kind of springboards with it. That's just an example. But uh, I'll try to briefly touch on the topic tomorrow, uh, or sorry, Wednesday. Um, I'm doing a JavaScript presentation for the 11 o'clock central EPGS and then a, a follow on um, for the mastering shiny at 6 p.m. central. Yeah, that will be that will be very interesting because yes. you know we we use a bit of this uh, HTML language inside uh, our Markdown or even even in a plot if you want to add some fee extra options uh, like I don't know colors of the text uh, or other things. But when you do our programming, you don't don't really need to do to do that. You. This is my my personal experience. You just need some f few, uh, let's say, words. W what are they? Like short sentences for adding uh, extra optional uh, to to your graphs or to your uh, documents in uh, when when you need in our Markdown. Um, because basically, our Markdown then need in within a HTML language. At the end, so you have different uh, uh, type of outcomes so that you uh, uh, so different uh, option for knitting your R Markdown and one is within within HTML language, but it does everything uh, un, uh, underneath the, the surface by itself. So you you just use R and simply writing. Um, as in a Word document, so you're, but, you're that, just, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah. No, well, your distiller, your your protocol translator, your language manipulation engine within that uh, that file type exchange is actually Pandoc, and I'll send that link as well. But um, Pandoc is is if you don't know it under the hood, Pandoc is how you render different output types. So it will ingest your R code and then generate back out HTML or your R markdown, for example. It'll ingest markdown, and then it'll mark up to HTML tags. Um, Pandoc is actually the, the uh, library that, that does most of that heavy lifting for you. I will just say thank you all for like bearing with me. I know I guess I started, it's been kind of extended over like three weeks from like a little bit before Christmas last week and this week. And I'm still very, very new to R. So I appreciate all of you guys' help. And yeah. Great session, Lydia. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. So yeah, I guess we um, we're almost at time. So Michael, we will continue the new. We will start with the new chapter next week. Yeah, we could do thirteen next week, and then I. Uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know if we have anyone for anything after that or fourteenth. Yeah, no, I don't think so. We the long list we had, is, I think, sort of done. I'll try to. Yeah. So yeah, uh, I guess I, I should say formally if anyone is interested in taking up the following chapters, um, ping me or ping, uh, you know, like say that you're interested in specific chapter on the um, book Slack channel and we can take it from there. Yeah, and uh, 
if uh, we want to do the tidy tuesday in the coming weeks i guess we could definitely do that as well like uh, you know whatever that week's data is and we all sit and um, sort of code at that time and and uh, you know brainstorm ideas and things like that talk about the questions that we come across um that's actually a great idea as well so if um if i don't know there is a specific um week that people want to do it or you know i mean anything bit between any of the following weeks or uh, end of the book uh, we can we can do it and uh, i'm on dvs uh, who i think ryan shared the dvs slack yes i'm there too <laughs> data visualization society yeah it's cool there is so much that goes on there i, I can't yeah. even keep up <laughs> you are part of that as well yes i am i i would i would only say that i'm probably a lurker at best i have not actively <laughs> participated in any oh, of yeah, the events that that they do. that's what i was saying so it, there is so much that goes on there so many it's channels huge. i just can't keep up but yep, yeah yep. i just lurk as well so anything that I see and it feels like I can be part of that I I read it or uh, there is um one of the recently I think they had one discussion in um December and they they have started doing this like pop up discussions about visualizations once a month where you know those these biggies who have written data visualization books you know they would have so two of the data dvs members and then two outsiders or uh, you know some some um well known authors or publishers they will bring them in and they they talk about you know specific i guess it's it's not a specific topic but then they just have conversations around data visualization and good things bad things um so the last time uh, i don't know if it was first but i i attended that and it was it was a nice discussion um one is actually planned for january as well it hasn't happened yet but if um, people are interested i'll check it out um I think it should be on my YouTube subscription. It should be soon. I think this week or so.